Our third and final speaker in this section this afternoon is Emmanuel Royard, who uh, was an undergraduate in Paris uh, and then uh, received a PhD from Yale in 2004 under the supervision of Margulis. Since then, he's had postdoctoral positions at the IAS, Princeton, and the IHES before joining the Ecole Polytechnique as an associate professor in 2006. Uh, since 2008, he's been a professor at Orsay. He works in group theory, um, particularly D groups, uh, discrete subgroups, and the interactions with geometry, number theory, and combinatorics. Uh, this afternoon, he's going to speak to us about diophantine geometry and uniform growth of finite and infinite groups. All right, thank you very much. First, I would like to, to thank the organizing committee for this invitation. It's a great honor for me to be able to speak here. Um, and, and then I'm going to um, start my, my talk. And so mo most of the talk will be about group growth. So, um, um, so G, G is a group, okay? And you, you start with a finite symmetric generating subset G. And you look at the, the n-fold product set. So that's the... Um, uh, the, the final set of elements in the group that you can obtain as a product of at most n uh, elements from your generating set. Okay. So the basic question is, uh, what can we say about this set? And then maybe the, the first thing we would like to know about this set is how large it, it is. Okay. So that's a very simple question, and um, um, it's a classical question which goes back to the 50s and 60s, and has classical connections with uh, Riemannian geometry um, in the work of Milner and Gormov, and operator algebra is also with work of, with, you know, connect, in connection with the uh, immutability. Um, uh, of course, it's a question in, um, in group theory, in combinatorial group theory, and geometric group theory. Uh, but more recently, the, the, there are new connections that. Uh, Rose's um, connection to model theory due to uh, a brilliant uh, idea of Kuchowski, and connections to additive combinatorics uh, with the um, uh, seminal work of Helcott uh, and continuing work of Sabo and myself at Green Town. So I'm not going to talk about these two subjects today. Um, I guess uh, Ben Green will um, touch upon these um, um, topics a bit in his uh, plenary talk next week. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, a connection with number theory and diagonal uh, geometry, in particular the Lambda conjecture. So, um, so when I, I talk about group world, I started with a group, so a group could be finite, could be infinite. Um, both cases are interesting. So if you start with an infinite group, what I mean by group world is that I'd like to, to understand the, um, uh, the asymptotics of the number of elements in this uh, S to the N. Okay, so, um, but if it's finite, then you, you ask for bounds for the diameter of your, of your group. Uh, the diameter of the group is the, the smallest N, the smallest number, such that every element in the group can be expressed as a product of N elements. And elements from the generating set. Okay. Um, so, so it turns out that um, in, in, in group theory, um, the two the two problems, the finite and infinite group cases, are um, are very connected to one another. So, uh, if you um, know something about finite group, uh, you can know something about an infinite group. For example, you can reduce mod p. So, if you have a linear group, you can reduce mod p and, and of information on this linear group, infinite um, circle of matrices being reduced by p and get information on the finite quotients. And vice versa, if you um, suppose you, you want to understand something but a class of finite groups, then typically what you can do is take a, um, some, some uh, construct some uh, object, some limiting object that would be an infinite group um, and study that infinite group in order to derive uh, properties of, of the family of finite groups. Okay, so um, let me start with the, the basics and the uh, uh, historically um, uh, the, the, you know, the basic 
cases. So the first case is when G is abelian, typically a fully abelian group like ZD. Um, then uh, it's known that the, the, um, this cardinal T S uh, of S to the N, which is the ball of race N in the case graph, um, is a polynomial in N, at least when N is big enough. So that was shown by various people. It's connected to um, the notion of Erhard polynomial, which is a polynomial, you know, if you take a, a, a polygon in a plane with, um, whose vertices are integer coefficients, and you dilate this polygon by a uh, factor n, then the number of integer points inside the polygon is a polynomial in n. It's called the Erhard polynomial. Actually, Erhard was, uh, was a you know, French high school teacher. He obtained a PhD at the age of 60. <laughs> So um, what about uh, the, the next case, the uh, Nilpotent case? Uh, Nilpotent case, so a group, you know, a group is Nilpotent, basically if it's non-abelian, well, abelian groups are examples of Nilpotent groups, but <laughs> if it's non-abelian, uh, but it's close to be abelian in the sense that you know, it has a non-trivial center, if you divide by the center, um, you again have a non-trivial center, and so on, and, 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 and this uh, process uh, ends up in a, in a finite number of steps. Uh, another way to describe Nilton groups is just to say that there are subgroups of upper triangle matrices with one on the diagonals. Okay. Um, so for example, this is the famous Heisenberg group. Um, and in this case, the, the growth is polynomial, so it's like constant times n to the d plus a remainder term. Um, the fact that it's a constant here is a theorem of, in, of Ponsumi. In 1983, and um, it's it's basically a ge geometric theorem. So the, the, the idea is you, you look at your uh, group and you take a limit when you look at it from very far. It's a Gromovian idea. Right? You look at it from far and you have a limit. This limit is the group, and and um, this S n has it's a, it, itself uh, the set S n has a limit, and this limit is in fact a, a unit ball for a certain left invariant um, sub riemannian metric, uh, or sub fits in fact, uh, metric on the people. Um, and and this, this constant S of S here is, um, um, is a unit, it, so it's the volume of that unit, of unit ball, this limit, limit shape. So uh, S to the N is not polynomial in general. Uh, in fact, this was shown by Stahl. In fact, the, the um, generating function generating power series of SN um, may not be a rational function. So, um, um, however, I think there is recent work of um, Moon Dushin uh, showing that in the Heisenberg case, it actually is. Um, and so, so this, because it's not polynomial, you, you don't have a good idea of what the remainder term is. However, so you, you can prove, uh, basically analyzing Ponzi's proof, you can, you can get a power series. So, um, so the, one of the main theorems uh, in, this, uh, in this context is, of course, Gorbos uh, polynomial growth theorem, uh, which uh, you're probably familiar with, which says that a group has polynomial growth if and only if it's especially impotent. Um, right, and so, so here typically the, the idea is to um, take a sequence of such, uh, of such groups and such sets and take a limit and study the limit. And so the, these recent improvements um, that I, so the, the, these methods uh, using model theory and the different metrics that I mentioned before, um, aim at improving uh, this uh, statement, improving in the sense that we get a finitary version of that. Of the formula. Finitary means that you don't actually need to uh, understand, to know that um, you have this polynomial growth condition for every n, but it's enough to know it for a sufficiently large n, for one n. So as a result, you, you, so you, for example, you can say something about finite groups, or that one of them says nothing about finite groups. Okay, so, but I, I, I'm not going to uh, focus this talk on, on, on that, so let me move on and talk about exponential growth. Okay. So in fact, most groups have exponential growth. Okay. Um, so if, you, if a group has exponential growth, um, so it just means the, um, means this, so if you look at S to the N, and you take the, the nth root of, uh, of S to the N, um, then uh, 
you can, this has a limit, okay? So this is the rate of exponential growth. This has a limit because S to the n, the size of S to the n is sub-applicative, so by the sub-additive sub language. Okay, so and, and it's, this limit is bigger than one. The fact that it's bigger than one does not depend on, on the choice of the generating set. However, the, the rates may depend. Okay. So examples of groups with polynomial growth include, um, you know, it's all started with geometry. So it started with Milner and Schwartz in the 60s, and they, they basically realized that you have, if you have a compact Fermanian manifold with a um, negative sectional curvature, uh, then Pyron. This property. Um, Milner and Wolf also showed in the 60s that if a group um, is solvable, then it has exponential growth unless it's virtually impotent. Okay, so virtually means there's a finite index of group that is impotent. And the cheese alternative um, answered this question as well. Actually, it was a question of Milner does, is it true that every group has either polynomial? Still unknown for finitely presented groups, um, but it's true for for linear groups. So for subgroups of G or G over a field, then Cheats showed that uh, if you're not virtually impotent, then actually you you have exponential growth. So what's the link with um, with algebraic numbers? Um, so so I'm going to be talking about a number theory in a second. Um, the point is that this number is very often So there are many examples of where we can show that. So for example, uh, Ken and Thurston showed um, that if the group is chromo-hyperbolic, so a particular uh, fundamental group of a compact um, uh, manifold with a curvature of minus one, uh, then, then the, this um, cardinality of the, um, the ball of rate sense, as to the n, satisfies some linear recurrence relation with uh, coefficients, um, so with integer coefficients. So, so you know, linear recurrence um, sequences, uh, we, we understand what they are. They are uh, basically uh, polynomials, sums of polynomials and exponentials. Um, so, sums and products. And so, so we can compute this, uh, this, this limit, and this limit is a root of the characteristic polynomial of that linear. Um, so, for example, Cannon and Backwright, they, they showed uh, that if you take the, um, you know, the fundamental group of closed surface um, with its typical presentation, um, then this um, growth rate is a salient number. Okay. What is a salient number? It's an algebraic number, um, which is real, bigger than one, and all whose conjugates, Galois conjugates, are inside the unit disk except one, except, um, sorry, yeah, I thought they're all inside the unit disk except one which is outside, and you also require that there is one on the unit circle. And so, in, in this case, rho of s is, is the unique, is, is a root of this explicit polynomial. Okay, so, so you, you understand pretty well. Um, so this brings me to the definition of the Mahler measure and the lemma projection. So, so let me recall the Mahler measure of the polynomial. Um, so, so x here is an algebraic number, and let pi of x be the uh, minimal polynomial with integer coefficients, and I factorize it. Okay, so the, the Mahler measure is this quantity. It's the absolute value of the leading coefficient multiplied by the products of the, of the roots that lie outside the, the unit circle. Okay, and there is a famous conjecture about this Mahler measure, which, in fact, originally uh, was uh, asked as a question, not as a conjecture. Um, so you can find books where actually the conjecture is formulated the other way. Uh, but um, so the conjecture is that there is a gap between four Mahler measures. So the Mahler measure of the polynomial of um, no, of a irreducible polynomial um, is either one or strictly bigger than one by a definite amount. So 
it, it's a well-known lemma in, in algebraic number theory that if the, the Malle measure is equal to one, then x is root of infinity. So it's called Konigin's lemma. Okay. So if it's equal to, to one, then of course the um, leading coefficient is one because it's an integer. Uh, so, so it means that x is an algebraic integer, and if you have an algebraic integer, all of whose conjugates lie inside the unit disk, then it has to be um, uh, a root of unity. Okay. Um, so, of course, if you have a root of unity, then uh, cyclical, cyclical, so it means that, yeah, so the, the only uh, irreducible polynomials with mal measure 1 are cyclic to make polynomials. So, um, the smallest known amount of measure, which is bigger than one, is that of this polynomial, degree 10 polynomial, so sometimes called the lemma polynomial. Um, and it's approximately this 1.17. Right. Um, so there's a funny, funny coincidence here, is that this, this um, amount of measure coincides with the growth rate of the 237 hyperbolic uh, triangle. Take the, um, the group generated by uh, the reflections around a triangle, geodesic triangle on the hyperbolic plane, which is, is uh, you know, with, uh, with angles pi over 2, pi over 3, pi over 7, then, then you can compute the growth rate, and surprisingly, it's exactly this now. Okay. Um, so, in fact, yeah, there's a similar uh, theorem accompanying it, which is, goes into the group. You know, generalizes this canon backlash theorem that I've stated, which which was for the pi one of closed surfaces, but the same holds for hyperbolic coexistent groups. And uh, so there are some numbers, and you could compute them. And so what's funny is that this group actually is also the uh, you know the orbit for the orbit surface of smallest possible cold volume. Okay, so um, so it uh, might be a coincidence, uh, maybe not. And uh, actually, this, so Yonaka showed that uh, this value is the smallest uh, possible growth rate among all hyperbolic oxygen groups. And as, as far as I can tell, it could be the smallest growth rate among all subgroups of SL2R. Okay. So here's a conjecture. Um, which I call the uniform growth conjecture. Um, which uh, says the following, so, um, uh, that's, so it, there's, there should be, uh, so yeah, there should be a, also a gap for the growth rate. Okay, so, so if, if you have, um, you, you are in GLDK of an arbitrary field, then the conjecture states that there should be a gap. So either you have the growth rate is one, okay? And in this case, you should be virtually impotent. You, have, you should have polynomial Growth. Or the growth rate must be uh, strictly bigger than one because you know, isolated, like in the lemma convention. Okay. Um, so, so yes, here's a side remark. So, is there a chance that th this epsilon could be possibly completely even independent of, of d? So, the point here is that epsilon should depend on, on d, okay, but, but not on the field. So is there a chance that it should be that it could be even in, in completely independent of D? And the answer is no. And the answer to it, so the reason the reason for this is the Kuykochuk group. Okay. So famously Kuykochuk uh, in the early 1980s gave an example of a group that grows whose growth is uh, intermediate, so it's not virtually impotent, so it does not grow polynomially, but yet the growth is not exponential. Okay. So that's the Kuykochuk group. And uh, the Grigor tube group um, uh, is, is uh, so let me define it for you. So it's uh, here you have the interval 0, 1. It's a group of transformation of the interval. Um, it's generated by four elements, A, B, C, D. The first element, A, it swaps the, the first, so you, you split your interval to two halves. And A just swaps the, the, the left half and, and the right half. Uh, B uh, does, you know, you you split the second interval into, into two, and so so this means that it acts like A on the first half, like A on the uh, third quarter, like the identity on, on this bit, and this dot means that you you view the last uh, eighth of your interval 
as your entire interval, and it means that on this last, last eight, B act exactly like it acts on the inter interval. Okay, so it's a recursive definition. Right? Um, so that's so that's the so it's very simple minded definition actually. So you see every every generator here has a, a order two. Okay, um, and it's easy to see from the definition that if you look at the subgroup that uh, uh, fixes the, the, left, the left half and the right half, um, so you, that's an index two subgroup, right? And that subgroup is actually isomorphic to, to the group itself. So, so it's a self-similar group. And in particular, it has to be an infinite group. Okay, so if it has an index two subgroup that's isomorphic to the group, it's an infinite group. And it's not, it's an exercise, at least, an undergraduate exercise, to show that every element in this group has order a power of two. So it's a torsion group. Okay? And as far as I know, it's the, it's the, the simplest example of uh, infinite torsion groups. The, the first examples were shown by Gold and Shafarevich in their work on Hilbert class fields in the 60s. Um, but this, this appeared later in the 70s, and that, that, that's, to, to me, the simplest example of an infinite torsion group. So of course, this group cannot be linear. It cannot embed into a GLD of something because there is a classical theorem of Shore from the early 1900s that says that a finitely generated a linear group cannot be torsion, okay, unless it's finite. But Gregor Chuk showed that this group has intermediate growth, okay, intermediate growth. It's not finally presented, and, and but what happens is that if you cut the presentation at some point, so you take this presentation. Take, take a presentation, order the, the relation by, by uh, length, then just cut, cut, cut it at the nth relation, and look at, look at this group Gn, all right? So Gn maps onto G, so that it's a cover, right? So it turns out that this cover, um, so it's a cover, right? But of course, the, the growth rate of this cover must tend to one. It tends to the, you know, locally, this group, you know, looks more and more like the limit, limiting group G, limiting group of true group. So, so the growth rate will tend to the growth rate of the degree of true group, which is one, because it's not an exponential growth. All right, so, so the growth rate tends to one, uh, and, and, but this group is e much easier to analyze, and Gregor Schub and Delarm show that this group is actually, um, well, there's a mistake, it's not virtually free, but it's virtually a product of uh, finitely many free groups. In particular, it's a linear group. So you know um, you can embed it inside some G of G N Z for for some very large D sub n, and so so you see the growth rate will tend to will tend to one. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So so let me show you um, a, a solvable example. So. Um, so, so, so I've been talking about Nilpotent groups. Um, so let's, let me talk about solvable groups now. So remember that this growth conjecture, right? This uniform growth conjecture <coughs> that we should have, we should have a, a gap here. <coughs> so in order to, to show that we have a gap, uh, let's consider just um, a simple example, right? So, so this uh, let's let's take two two by two matrices. Uh, it's one one zero one and x zero zero one. Okay, in G of two. Well, it's very it's very easy to compute the ball of radius n. So it's, you know you can analyze it. Uh, uh, you look you look at a part of n, n such matrices. You see that you're gonna get here uh, edge to the k of some k, and in this coordinate instead of zero, you're gonna get some polynomial of degree n in x. And you ask how many elements you get. So there is a very easy observation. This Growth rate is at most equal to the Mahler measure of the polynomial, the minimum polynomial of x. And why is that? It's because you, you're going to embed your, you know, your q of x into your uh, geometric embedding of your number field q of x, and um, and so your your ball s to the n will lie in some box, and the bottom of the box is basically the Mahler measure to the power n. Okay. So that's um, that's a simple observation. And as a consequence, the uniform growth conjecture implies a limit. Okay. So if you, if you have a uniform load bound of this, then you have uniform load bound of the number. 
So, um, okay. Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is what happens for this simple example. Uh, it turns out that the converse is true as well. So in this particular example, so that's a recent work uh, with uh, Peter Barview, uh, we, we managed to show that the, the, the growth rate is also bounded below, uh, not by the Mahler measure, but by some function of the Mahler measure, which some function which grows with the Mahler measure. So it's, uh, it's bigger, so it's increasing function. So in particular, um, if you know the lemma conjecture, if you know that uh, the Mahler measure cannot be too close to one, then you have a uniform lower bound on the growth rate. Okay. So, so we conclude that the, the lemma measure is actually equivalent to the uniform growth conjecture in this particular case, in the case of this simple-minded example. Okay. So actually, this so the yeah this bound is used. So we, we use some additive combinatorics here, some some set estimates for the entropy. So it's related to, to the Bermuda convolutions. Um, all right. So what, what happens in the, in the non solvable case? Um, so, so here's the main theorem. Um, in the non solvable case, you, you actually do not need uh, the, the lemma conjecture. The, the theorem holds. So the, the, there, is, there is a gap. So the, there is a gap. There's a gap for the growth rate, and, and this gap is independent of, the, of, of s and, and k. It depends on the d. All right. Um, so non non solvable means non virtually solvable. So if you if you've never encountered solvable groups, um, in, in this particular case of linear groups or groups of GL of matrices, a group is solvable if and only if or virtually solvable, if and only if you can basically conjugate it inside the upper triangle matrices of two So you, could, you should think about upper, upper triangle matrices as being uh, solvable. So when it's not solvable, then it's not. It cannot be conjugated inside the upper triangle matrices. So combining the, 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 the theorem one and two, we get that actually the, you know, the uniform growth conjecture is equivalent to the lemma. Okay, but of course, in the non-solvable non case, we don't need the lemma conjecture. Okay, so that's so the, the, the remainder of the talk, I will explain why we don't need it and what what's what's uh, what's known from number theory that en enables us en enables us to to actually prove this theorem unconditionally. Right. So um, so so this theorem is, as I said, deduced from. Uh, Number theory to result, theorem you know, three below, using some ideas of cheese, which is this ping pong argument, um, which uh, actually in this context builds some uh, earlier work of Eskin, Moses, and all, and also on um, uh, related work that I did before with uh, my collaborator at Sahih So, um, so to understand this, uh, how this number theoretic, theoretic statement. I have to go back to the notion of veil height, and, and so the, the veil height is you know, a very useful notion in, in uh, diagonal geometry. It's basically the log of the Mahler measure divided by the degree. Okay, so there's an equivalent expression in terms of uh, places and absolute values of fields. So if you have a number field, you can write this veil height as basically uh, a weighted sum of the log of the absolute values at the different places, the, the periodic places, including the periodic places. So, um, so the advantage of writing it this way is that you, it's independent of k. So if you take log k, then it's still, it's still true. Okay, so, um, so the properties of the height is that it's, the height is a positive quantity, not negative. It's equal to zero if and only if you're a root of unit c. Um, it has this multiplicative um, behavior. Um, all right. Um, so, so here's the main theorem. Here's the main theorem. Uh, so, yeah. So, in order to, to, to show that you have growth, so the, the key idea is to show that you can have eigenvalues that do not stay that you know that are not too small. Okay. 
but not too small in what in what in what measure. So not too small in the for, for the wheel for the for which for which valuation. So you need to find evaluation where you have eigenvalues that are not too small. Okay. So actually, understanding eigenvalues of elements of linear groups is something which is not very easy. In fact, um, there is a beautiful work of uh, Passat and Arbinschuk on this subject, which um, tells you interesting information about the eigenvalues of elements of uh, lattices or or Zarsky-Lenzago uh, of semi simple groups. So, and Andre is speaking about it next week. Well, so 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 this goes into this direction as well. So it says that um, if you have um, any set S of matrices that generates a non virtually solvable subgroup, then you can find a short word in, this, in, these, uh, in, in these elements which has an eigenvalue with large height. Height bigger than 1, or this height bigger than epsilon, epsilon take the power bigger than 1. So the height cannot be too small. All right? Uh, so again, the reason I'm interested in this is because once I have an element with large height, then I, you know, I can take powers of it. Then I have, you know, then I can do this um, Tietz ping pong game, which uh, allows me actually to build a free subgroup inside my group, and therefore to show that I have uh, exponential uniform exponential growth. Right. Um, so in order to understand. Uh, why I, I, I do find an element with large height. Um, so I need to understand what happens if, if all the, these elements have eigenvalues with small height. So, and, and, and there is a beautiful theorem, a uh, recent theorem, uh, late 90s of uh, UV, which tells you something about uh, algebraic numbers with small height. Uh, so the theorem says that if you have any sequence of algebraic numbers whose, side, who, whose height goes to zero, um, but it's not equal to zero, then if the Galois orbit becomes equidistributed towards the unit seven. Okay. So so not you know so so it's um, key uh, theorem. In fact, uh, the, one of the I see Mendel Ulmo here is is one of the. A precursor to the theorem, in which this theorem was proven for a billion varieties because before it was proven in this case, and, and, and it's a theorem of Emmanuel. Um, so here's another um, connected result, which is uh, Jean's theorem about. Um, uh, so so this, this theorem of Jean tells you what happens when you have. Uh, when, uh, so. Uh, it tells you something about points on a variety with small height. So I re we remind you that um, roots of unices have height zero. So now suppose that you have you have a variety, a closed algebraic subset of uh, a fine space, okay? And you look you look on it uh, you look on it at the, the the points that are have very small height. So for example, the points whose coordinates are roots of unity, okay? And the amazing fact is that this this set, this set is not Zariski dense. So um, yeah, so 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 in other words, if you have a variety and you look at the points whose 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 um, coordinates are roots of unity, then it's containing a smaller algebraic variety. Okay, so so, uh, so this is um, Jean's theorem, and it, so it's always containing a smaller algebraic variety unless. Unless your variety is very special, unless your variety is a torus itself, okay. So if your your variety is, um, let's say, just um, given by some equation like this, a product of x1 to the n1 to x t to the n d equals one, then um, then you have lots of rules of unity, of course, inside. Okay, but that's the only reason. And so let me show you an example. So for example, so if you have z1 plus z2 equals one, that's a line. In Plane. You have a line in the plane, right? C1 plus C2 equals 1. And I claim that uh, they cannot be the, the only fact, so it has dimension 1. So, what does it mean to be not Zariski dense? It means you're finite. So, I claim that you know, um, if you, there are only finitely many points with height less than something. And this something, in fact, was, there is a, a bound due to Zagier in this case, which is log square root of the um, the golden ratio, it shows that unless 
the C1 is, is one of these two, four numbers, um, then this, the height is, is, uh, is large. And it turns out this theorem of, of Jung is a consequence of Bill's theorem. And let me show you why in this particular example. Okay, so we so here is a picture. Right? So so it's the complex plane, this is the unit circle. And Vilus theorem tells you that if, if Z1 has very small height, then it, its gamma orbit becomes pretty distributed on the unit circle. But if Z2 also has small height, then also it's you know it's gamma orbit becomes a pretty distributed towards the unit circle. But Z1 plus Z2 goes wrong. So Z2 is both equidistributed on the red circle and on the right circle. That can be. Okay? You cannot be both equidistributed on these two circles. Unless something wrong, something is wrong. And so the, the only way this could happen is if you are actually at an intersection of these two points, of, of these two circles. So that's why you have e to the i i3. Right. So that's uh, that's the reason. So so in our case, um, uh, so in, in our case, we're going to take advantage of this result in order to prove that you have elements with large heights. So what would happen if all of your eigenvalues of all of your elements in S of n had very small height? Um, then this basically this theorem of Jung will tell you that if this happens, then your your original set S must lie on some very special variety, so some torus. There should be there should be some um, uh, specific uh, algebraic condition uh, relating these things, the, the, the coefficients of the original set S, and that's going to violate somehow the hypothesis that you are now virtually solvable. So in order to achieve this, one thing uh, that is very uh, handy is to consider what's called the joint spectral radius of a set of matrices. So if you have a set of matrices, you can look at this quantity, which is basically the exponential growth weight um, of, of, your, of your set. So it's called the joint spectral radius, which was introduced by Bota and Strong in the 60s. And then it turns out that there's a beautiful inequality uh, due to Jairo Boki. Relating the joint spectral radius and the maximal eigenvalue of um, some word in S. So this inequality tells you that, you know, so of course, the jo you see the, this joint spectral radius is always at least equal to the maximal eigenvalue of S. So if you have an element in S, look at its maximal eigenvalue, take its powers, it's going to grow at least, like, it's, you know, it's going to grow at some rate, and therefore the joint spectral radius will be bigger. So the joint spectral radius is bigger than the biggest second value of any element of S. But this says that, in fact, you can always find a small word in S that has an eigenvalue that grows, you know, that, that is already uh, responsible for the growth rate, the joint spectral, you know, the joint growth rate. Okay? Um, so, so this uh, inequality holds over R, it holds over C, it holds over QP, and uh, in fact, it's even holds with a constant equal one over atomic fields here. And so, um, so what you need to do is to combine all these things together and uh, write this, um, uh, introduce this height, this combined height. You look at the combined spatial radius at all places. And it's easy to see that this is the same thing as the normalized height. So you take the limit of, of one over n h s to the n. So what you obtain this way is um, conjugation, conjugation invariant uh, number. Uh, so, so, so it's a high function of character variety of GLD. Okay, so you look at GLD to the k, and I put a double bar here because I, I want to talk about the GLD quotient. Um, and so that's the character variety, and your, your, your set S actually lies here. That's a, and this uh, height is a height function on that uh, variety. Okay. And so you can, um, I can now um, uh, transform um, my, my theorem into this one. So that, that's the form in which I'm in which is proven. So the, the point is that you, you prove that this 
unless S is virtually solvable, then this normalized height is bounded away from zero, or cannot be close to zero. Okay. Uh, and and um, so I said that one of the main tools of this is the theorem of, of Shubujang, which tells you that if this doesn't happen, that it means that S must you know, somehow satisfy some algebraic conditions. And uh, this uh, will violate the fact that you generate a big loop. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you.